we all know, last week was Easter Sunday. And on Easter Sunday, we preached the resurrection from Mark's gospel, the very end of Mark's telling of the life and ministry of Jesus. This morning, uh, we look at the backstory. This morning, we are beginning an eight-week journey through Mark's gospel, where we will uncover the events leading up to Resurrection Sunday. We will see the backstory of Jesus' life in ministry. And while that sounds like a great plan, I can tell you from the very beginning, as we start at chapter 1, verse 1, we are going to feel a resistance to today's message. We are going to read a bit of the story of these early followers of Jesus, and we're going to want to separate ourselves from them. It's going to be our natural instinct to say these are people unlike us in a time unlike ours. My word to you this morning, before we even read it, is don't let that happen. I'm going to help us in that. If you are here this morning, please raise your hand. This is an easy one. If you are here this morning, please raise your hand. Thank you. So now hear this. Christ is calling you. He's calling each one of us to follow him. Will we obey? Let us begin Mark's gospel. Mark chapter 1, verse 1. If you've got that in front of you, give me a loud amen. Amen. And the scripture reads, The beginning of the good news about Jesus the Messiah, the Son of God, as it is written in Isaiah the prophet, quote, I will send my messenger ahead of you who will prepare your way, a voice of one calling in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord and make straight paths for him, end quote. And so John the Baptist appeared in the wilderness, preaching a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. The whole Judean countryside and all the people of Jerusalem went out to him. Confessing their sins, they were baptized by him in the Jordan River. John wore clothing made of camel's hair with a leather belt around his waist, and he ate locust and wild honey. And this was his message. After me comes the one more powerful than I, the straps of whose sandals I am not worthy to stoop down and untie. I baptize you with water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. Skip down in the story just a brief bit to verse 14. After John was put in prison... Jesus, the one that John was preparing the way for, Jesus went into Galilee, proclaiming the good news of God. The time has come, he said. The kingdom of God has come near. Repent and believe the good (coughs) news. Amen. Amen. It's the start of Mark's Gospel. And there's a couple things you can notice at the very beginning. There's no angels. There's no shepherds. There's no Christmas story in Mark's Gospel. As we read through Mark's Gospel, we'll see that trend continue. Mark gives you the story of Jesus quickly. And here he he doesn't give us a Christmas story, but Mark's gospel begins with an opening line of theological power. It doesn't begin with a story. It begins with a statement of theological power. Mark's gospel begins, he's telling us that this is the beginning of good news about Jesus, the Messiah. 
the translation, the Bible in front of you, may have good news translated as the gospel. But Mark is telling us what we will see in the next 16 chapters. This is the beginning of the good news. This is the beginning of the gospel. And that demands a few moments of our attention. Mark has given us the prelude to what he's about to unfold. This is the beginning of the good news, the beginning of the gospel. Well, what, what, what is the gospel? What is the good news? We'll uncover it in the next 16 chapters, but let us go ahead and get our mind focused on it right here and now. You have in your bulletin, your GPS, your Grow, Pray, and Study Guide. It gives you an opportunity to jot some of this down. Here on the screen, and we'll work through this for a little bit, is my definition of the gospel. Um, you've seen this before, and you will see it many times again. But here's my attempt to give us something to wrap our mind around when Mark tells us that he's about to begin the good news of Jesus, the gospel of Jesus. The gospel is the story of God reconciling and redeeming through the life, death, burial, resurrection, and future return of Jesus Christ as fulfillment of Old Testament promises. The gospel is a witness to God's grace. I realize that um, that needs some unpacking. Um, you also have in your uh, GPS, hopefully you've completed that sentence, but you've got some room to, to write down what some of these words mean. And I intentionally want you to write these down because I want you to think through them. I don't want to just hand you something and you see it on a screen and you check a box and walk out of here. I want you to have to write some of this down. I want you to have to think through some of this. The gospel is the story of God reconciling. It means that God, through the story of Jesus, is healing a relationship broken by sin. Mm -hmm. That anything that we do that is outside of the will of God, that's a big umbrella. Right? <laughs> Anything that we do that is outside the will of God, the Bible labels as sin. The Bible also describes that that sin damages our relationship with God. Not, not from his end, but from our end. We, in our sin, are separating ourselves, distancing ourselves from God. And it's in the life, death, burial, resurrection of Jesus that God reconciles that. He heals that broken relationship. The gospel is the story of how God <clears throat> fixes us. How he takes us from broken things and makes us whole through Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. Get it? In, in Jesus Christ alone. Right? It's the gospel. It's that Jesus heals us. It's Jesus that makes us whole. It's our sin that damages the relationship. It's Jesus that heals us. Not only is God reconciling, but he's also redeeming. All right, so, so God doesn't just pick us up and make us whole and allow us to carry on. But in redeeming, God also gives us purpose and power. And he's healed us because of our sin. And then he allows us to actually play a role in his church. Mm -hmm. Or in the language of the beginning of Mark, that we actually get to play a role in this kingdom of God. Amen. And if we confess Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior, we are made whole through the forgiveness of sin. And then we are given purpose and power to partake to participate in the things of God. In grace, we know this. We need reminded of it over and over again, but we know this. 
God heals us. He gives us purpose and power, but it's not because we've worked for it. <coughs> it's not because we deserve it. It's not because we've achieved it somehow. God just gives it to us. As demonstrated on the cross, that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Amen. Not because we were good, right? because we were sinners. And that first Easter morning, Jesus rose from the dead, giving us victory over sin and death. The Gospels, the story of God reconciling and redeeming through the life, death, burial, and resurrection and future return of Jesus Christ, this fulfillment of Old Testament prophecies, the Gospel is a witness to grace. That's a mouthful. And sometimes our Gospel writers shorthand that. And they'll say something like this. This is 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 11, where the Apostle Paul, attempting to spit out the gospel as quickly as possible, said Jesus died for our sins. Jesus was buried. Jesus was raised on the third day. And Jesus proved his bodily resurrection by appearing to the disciples. The Apostle Paul, it's that gospel by which you are saved. It's Jesus here at the beginning of Mark saying, repent and believe this. Jesus died for your sins. And he was buried and he was raised on the third day. And then there's also an interesting word, and this, this can't be overlooked. I, I put in my little summation of the gospel that this life, death, burial, resurrection, and future return of Jesus Christ is the fulfillment of Old Testament promises. It would take some work to see this, but that's in the beginning of Mark as well. Notice, it says the beginning of the good news about Jesus. But it doesn't stop there, right? It, the beginning of the good news about Jesus the Messiah. That's theological language saying that Jesus is the anointed one, that Jesus yeah. is the fulfillment of all the Old Testament promises. Yeah. For, for the people that had been waiting on a Savior to come, the people that had been reading the Old Testament, waiting for one to come, Mark just said, he's Jesus. He's here. All that stuff you've hoped for, all those promises made by God, are found in Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. so in the 16 chapters of Mark, we're going to find stories of God reconciling and redeeming mm -hmm. and God giving grace. Mm -hmm. And if we understand this framework, that God reconciles, redeems, that is the fulfillment of Old Testament promises, that God gives us grace, we see that gospel unpacked in every single story that we will read through in these 16 chapters. We see God reconcile, redeem, and give grace when, when Jesus cast out an evil spirit. Or when Jesus calms a storm on a sea. Or when Jesus has a paralyzed man stand up and walk. Or when Jesus sits down at a table with a group of sinners. Or when Jesus speaks the very words of God. And even if we missed all that, there's going to come a point in the story where Jesus hangs on a cross for the sins of the world. Just in case we missed it. Mm -hmm. Jesus, the sinless Son of God, is going to hang on the cross for the sins of the world, including the sins in this room. Mm -hmm. And the things of evil, the things of this world, thought they'd won. And then comes Easter morning. Where Jesus is raised from the dead. Amen. Showing that God can heal things that are broken. He can reconcile them. He doesn't just leave them healed, but, but he redeems them. He gives them yes. purpose and power. And not because we 
worked for it, earned it, or deserved it, because we're just sinners. But God has given grace. Mm -hmm. Mark's Gospel. Though we love a good Christmas story, amen? <laughs> doesn't begin with the Christmas story. It gives us an opening line of theological power. He's telling us what you are about to read is the beginning of the good news about Jesus the Messiah. Amen. Now, now that we got that under our belts, now we've got our mind around what we're about to read through for eight weeks, I'm going to take that concept and bring it into your living room this morning. Because after this opening line, Mark gets down to business. He, he begins from a theological statement of power, and he jumps right in to the call of Jesus. And I think Mark's telling us something here. That at the heart of our faith is obedience to the call of Jesus. We grasp that? We've sung about that this morning, right? <clears throat> Sam's very good at his job. We've, we've sung songs about hearing God call us and responding in obedience. This is the core of our faith. This is what it means to live out the gospel, to be gospel people, that we hear Jesus call us and we follow in obedience. That's what phones used to look like. Um, and, and I did that intentionally, because right? there's nothing new here. God has been calling people from the very beginning of the gospel story. And we now fall in line in the history of the church. With God calling us, the question becomes, will we obey? So we've already read it. Mark moves from this theological statement to John the Baptist. John the Baptist was called to prepare the way of Jesus. And he was obedient. Yeah. And John the Baptist was called to call people to repentance. <clears throat> and he was obedient. And I know what you're thinking. This is one of those passages where I just know what you're thinking. You're like, but surely John the Baptist was some sort of special case. Right? Um, for one, his call in obedience was the fulfillment of the scriptures that Isaiah wrote about. You know, that's not me. You know, and look, John the Baptist, he, he, uh, he wore camel's hair. Right? I have a leather belt, but it's not going around camel hair, right? And, and I'm definitely not eating locusts and wild honey. We immediately want to go, Ugh. call in obedience, but this is not talking about me. You hear that? That's a special case, right? Wrong. Because if we keep reading, let's pick this story up at verse 16. As Jesus walked beside the Sea of Galilee, he saw Simon and his brother Andrew casting a net into the lake, for they were fishermen. Come, follow me, Jesus said, and I will send you out to fish for people. So there's a call. Look at verse 18. <coughs> at once they left their nets and followed him. Amen. There's obedience. 19, when he had gone a little farther, he saw James, son of Zebedee, and his brother John in a boat preparing their nets. Without delay, he called them. There's another call. And they left their father Zebedee in the boat with the hired men and followed him. There's obedience once again. Call of Jesus followed by obedience. 
And you think, well, John the Baptist was just a special case. He had a special role to fulfill. He's this prophet-type character. That's not like me. And then just a few verses later, there's Simon and Andrew and James and John. Just average guys doing average work. And they get a call. Come follow me. And they obey. I love the vivid description we get. The first two, at once they left their nets and followed him. Didn't think about it. Didn't ponder it over. Right? Didn't do a Bible study on it. Right? Didn't tell them Jesus will pray about it and get back with you. Just at once left their nets and followed him. Because when you hear the good news, when you hear that you can be healed from your sin, that when you can be reconciled to God, that God has the ability to redeem you and to hand you grace, you don't think about that. You accept it. And I love the description on the second act of obedience. Uh, The next two... Without delay, he called them, and they left their father Zebedee in the boat. (laughs) Just left him there with the hired men, right? Guys, take care of Dad. We've got to go follow Jesus. Call and obedience, because when you understand the gospel, when a Savior is reaching his hand out to you, you obey. Call and obedience. And I know what you're thinking. You know, you didn't like John the Baptist because that's too far. So that, that's just too much. I'm, I'm, I'm too much unlike John the Baptist. And then I, I brought in these four men doing average work and called by God. And you're like, okay, that's closer to me. <laughs> um, then you want to stop and you want to go, you know, Pastor Jeff, that's that's a great passage of scripture. But that's not real life. You're thinking in the back of your head, eh, that can't be me, right? I've got a family and a mortgage. I can't be dropping nets. I can't be leaving things behind to follow Jesus. That's that's not real life. I would beg to differ. That this is real life. It is the call God is placing on you. I do admit it may look a tad different. A tad different. How, How does this become real life for us? For the people in this room. I've wrote a few things down. Dropping your net looks like choosing the things of God over the things of this world. (coughs) Dropping your net looks like confession of sin and repentance from sin. Dropping your nets looks like placing faith in God Rather than faith in self. You might be going, oh, Pastor Jeff, that's a little vague. Can we make this a little tighter? Okay. Glad you asked. (laughs) Dropping your nets looks like loving your spouse like Jesus loved the church. Dropping your nets looks like loving your neighbor even when it's really difficult to do so. Dropping your nets looks like offering forgiveness, even when you're tempted to offer curse words. Dropping your nets looks like denying self and serving others. Dropping your nets looks like taking the time and effort to encourage someone 
dropping your nets looks like praying for someone rather than passing along gossip. All these times you guys, you, you write them down and then if you go to say it, you're like, uh, why did I write that one down? But it's written down, so I'm going to say it. <laughs> Dropping your nets looks like teaching your kids to love Jesus more than sports or test scores. Now that I said it, I wish I said it a little louder, so I'm going to work up a little confidence on it. <laughs> Dropping your nets looks like teaching your kids to love Jesus more than sports test scores. Dropping your nets looks like living in integrity rather than cutting corners. Dropping your nets looks like speaking truth rather than spreading lies or opinions. Dropping your net looks like reading the word of God and actually obeying it. Dropping your net looks like giving testimony to the work of God in your life. Dropping your nets looks like giving up on stress and worry and replacing that with the peace of God that guards your hearts and mine. <laughs> I threw out a couple examples of what this looks like in real life. It is my prayer that as I was reading through those, if those hit home, I hope they stay at home. But I also hope that as I was reading through those, if I didn't hit on your particular itch, that you made that jump yourself. What it looks like for you to hear the call of God and obey. It all begins with Jesus' words in verse 15. He says, the time has come. The kingdom of God has come near. Repent and believe the good news starts there, that apart from God, you can do nothing, that apart from Jesus Christ, you are dead in sin. He says, repent, give your life to me, and experience the fact that God can reconcile, he can, he can provide forgiveness of sin, not only that, I can empower you. All through grace. No work of your own. Just come to me. The time has come. The kingdom of God has come near. Repent and believe the good news. That's the start. And then we begin dropping nets everywhere we go. God is calling you to follow him in, in complete clarity. Jesus is calling you to follow him. Amen. Obey. If you understand the gospel, drop your nets. Let us pray.